Good morning and welcome to the digital worship service of Calvary Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Chuck and I'm so glad you've joined us here this morning as we continue our study in the book of Galatians. As we prepare our hearts for worship this morning, let us go before the Lord together in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for the wonderful things you have done for us. We thank you for the gift of your word. And we thank you, Lord, that we can come before you wherever we are to worship you, to praise your name, and to study your scripture. I pray this morning as we look into your word, Lord, that you would illuminate the text for us, that you would show us more truth about your son, Jesus, and the effect he has in our lives, and that we would be inspired this morning to cling firmly to the cross of Christ and to the gospel that is presented in your holy scriptures. Thank you for today, Lord. We love you and we praise you in the precious name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's worship the Lord together this morning. Thank you. 
so good to worship our Lord and Savior together. Um, this morning, I ask that you open up your Bibles to the book of Galatians chapter 1 as we continue our study therein. And as we look at the text this morning, what we are going to see is that the people of the churches of Galatia are beginning to depart from the gospel that Paul had given them. And he is astonished and he is shocked. You know, if we look at our country right now, there are a lot of things happening in our country that I imagine the framers of our Constitution would be shocked at as well. You know, if you look at the framers and the way that they put our Constitution together, the way they founded our country, there were certain ideals that were embedded into the document of the Constitution itself. Uh, ideas of limited government with a balance of powers and checks and balances at every level, making sure that the federal government didn't hold too much sway over the states and also that the federal government didn't hold too much sway over the individual citizens of our nation. Uh, it was never intended that the government would be involved in things like education and transportation, and yet we see that these are cabinet positions now serving and advising the president as the president kind of oversees these different areas of our nation. And when you look at how large our government has grown and you look at how far the arms of influence reach from our federal government into different state practices, you know, I think the framers of our constitution would be shocked. I think that they would be astonished. I think that they would be surprised. And you know, the changes that have taken place in our government over the past several years, well, they have some serious ramifications for the individual citizens living in the nation. There's ramifications as to how we operate and how we live, our personal liberties, our personal freedoms. And so, yeah, I believe that the framers of the Constitution, if looking at our government and political system today, I think they would be shocked. I think they would be appalled. And I think to some degree they would be terrified when they see how much reach our federal government has today. Now, right or wrong, you know, I believe that that's what the framers would see. And that is but a glimpse of the feelings that Paul has as he looks to the Galatians. Because as he looks to the churches of Galatia, what he sees is that they are being infested with a false gospel. And the ramifications for the individuals living in the churches of Galatia and for the people who would then come to follow this false gospel, well, the ramifications are far greater than any ramifications that we see in a changing of our Constitution. The ramifications have eternal significance. Because as Paul you know, says so often in the scriptures that there's only one name by which we can be saved. And the only way we can be saved is by placing our faith and trust in Jesus. For we are justified by faith and not by works of the law. And so as Paul comes to these people, as he is writing to them, he is shocked and he is astonished that they are so quick to abandon the gospel that they heard. So what is it that they're going to? Well, as we learn as we continue in the book of Galatians, there are people who have come to try to place the Galatian churches under the authority of the law. People from, from the churches in Jerusalem have been sent and they have been telling people that in order to be a Christian, in order to be a follower of Christ, you must first be Jewish. You must be circumcised. You must adhere to the Old Testament law in all of its different forms. And that's the only way that you can truly be saved. And of course, Paul completely rejects this belief and completely rejects this mindset. And we're going to see how strongly he rejects this mindset as we look at Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 10 this morning. And so we begin looking at verse 6, and, the Paul, and Paul, the apostle, writes to the churches of Galatia. He says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. So here, Paul has received word that there are, are those in the church who are leaving the simple truth of the gospel towards some other kind of gospel. And again, Paul clarifies here, not that there is another gospel. There is only one gospel. There is only one good news, and that good news is salvation through Jesus Christ. 
but they're leaving it and they're abandoning it for some other teaching that has tickled their ears. And so as we look at this opening two verses here in this section, we have to ask ourselves, well, what is the gospel that Paul is referring to? What's the gospel that he gave to the churches of Galatia? Well, we don't have to wonder about that because Paul quotes the gospel over and over and over again in many of his other epistles. And so, uh, but if we want a clear, concise stating of what that good news is and what the gospel is, well, we look over at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, starting in verse 3. Turn your Bibles over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And in verse 3, we see Paul is, is talking here about the resurrection. He's defending the idea of the resurrection. And in chapter 15, verses 3 and 4, we have the most concise, the most clear, the most poignant phrasing of the gospel that we see probably anywhere else in Scripture. And so that passage says, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. That's it. Of first importance, Paul says, is this truth. And then he gives it to the churches of Corinth the same way that he received it, that Christ died for our sins and that Christ was buried and that he was raised on the third day. That's the gospel. That, that's the gospel in a nutshell. You know, what is it that you need to understand and what is it that you need to believe to be forgiven, to be redeemed, to be justified, to be saved? How can I be placed in right standing with God? Jesus died for our sins, was buried, and was raised from the dead. You believe that. You profess that. And you place your faith and trust on him who was crucified and you are saved. You are forgiven. You are set free. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the good news. That's the reason we praise him. That's the reason we gather together. That's the reason we worship. That's the reason we study scripture, because Jesus Christ died for us. And by placing our faith and trust in him, our sins are forgiven and we are saved. And so there's a distortion that was taking place during the day that Paul was writing these letters to the churches of Galatia. You know, members of the church of Jerusalem, they were sent and they were going in telling the people that, well, yeah, you have to place your faith in Jesus, but you also have to be circumcised. But you also have to follow the law. And Paul here says that, that he is astonished that they would be so quick to abandon the gospel to follow this other teaching because Paul cemented in them. Paul, Paul taught them while he was there the truth of what the gospel was. And this is a warning to us today that we need to be weary of, of different false teachings and false teachers who will enter into the Christian sphere and try to influence people away from the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because, you know, some of the most dangerous attacks on the church, they don't come from outside the church. A lot of people will look at the, the teachings of Islam and say, well, they're so dangerous for Christians. And they'll look at teachings of Mormonism and, and the Watchtower Society and all these different kind of cultish groups. But there is a group that has been rising in the United States specifically for the past several years that has such a dangerous influence on Christianity and our Christian culture. And that is known as progressive Christianity. You know, progressive Christianity has all kinds of teachings and all kinds of false doctrines that they push and that they move forward. And the dangerous thing about progressive Christianity is that it sounds so close to being true, and yet they shift the focus just a little bit, and then suddenly what you have is false teaching. Go do a Google search of, of progressive Christian doctrine, and you will see that the progressive Christian church isn't really Christian. And the things they believe and the things they teach, they are so far removed from Christianity that it's frightening. And yet, they teach and they proclaim under the guise of being Christians who love Jesus and Christians who love God. 
and, and as an example of that, and as an example of the kind of false teaching that we need to be weary of, I have an article that I want to read for you here this morning. Uh, this article comes from progressivechristianity.org. It was written in uh, 2017, and it is written in response to the question of why did Jesus die? Why did Jesus die on the cross? Now, the author of this article uh, is a pastor of a church. He was a pastor of a church. Uh, he was, became pastor of that church sometime in the 1980s. He was pastor of that church until about 2004 when he retired from ministry there. And then in 2006 became the president of progressivechristianity.org. And so he had been preaching regularly that Jesus did not die for our sins which is a common belief in the progressive Christian movement. And so someone asked him, well, if Jesus didn't die for our sins, then why did he die? I want you to listen to his response. I just want you to listen to this article that he wrote concerning the question of why did Jesus die? He writes this, I do not know the actual reason that Jesus was killed. The Bible gives us some hints when you remove some of the theology that was added over the next 200 years and its development. It is difficult for people living in modern society to imagine the conditions the Jewish people were living under Roman rule. Most of the Jews had suffered terrible treatment by the Roman soldiers and the Romans in general. And if you lived in Galilee a distance in those days, it could be even more difficult. The Galileans lived in a hilly area full of big boulders and caves. The men were known to be excellent street fighters who would create a fracas near the city and get the soldiers to follow them into the hills and then attempt to slaughter as many of them as they could, hiding behind the boulders and in the caves. But they paid a price for these activities. Galileans were particularly hated or feared by the Roman soldiers and as a result were treated accordingly. Also, it is important to understand that when Jesus went into Jerusalem, it was during the Passover Holy Day. This was and is a very important celebration of the Jews escaping Egyptian slavery. Every year for decades, this was one of the most turbulent times in the region. Most of the Jews were trying to eke out a living, farming what land they still had and paying taxes to the Romans. Many of them had to give up owning their land and essentially becoming tenant farmers of the empire because, in part at least, they could not pay their taxes. And here they were, supposedly celebrating being freed, no longer slaves to the Egyptians, but they knew that they were slaves again. During these holidays, Rome would send an additional 10,000 soldiers to surround the city and they were instructed to kill anyone who did not seem like they were following orders. Do not kid yourself. There were no courts, no judges, and no leniency for the Jews if they tangled with a Roman soldier. And finally, it is clear that the act of crucifixion was used as an intimidating tool by the Romans, as it was by the Syrian rulers before them. There were five entrances into the city that could be quickly closed off. However, the Romans would pick a spot near any of the gates for cru the crucifixion. They would normally let the bodies hang there for days, waiting for men or women to die, and then for the birds to eat the flesh. It is estimated that in most cases, it took days for the criminals to die. Death by crucifixion was, by Roman law, supposed to be reserved for those who had done a serious crime, but one of the most serious crimes was insurrection, defying Roman rule. These crucifixions were done in such a way that anyone going into Jerusalem would have to pass one of those crosses. They were literally thousands of men, women, and even children killed in this manner. Sadly, crucifixion was not unusual, and it had been that way for hundreds of years. Jesus chose to walk into the city on this high intensity day. Did the Romans assume his being there was reason enough? Did the Romans kill him because he supposedly claimed to be king of the Jews? Did they arrest and kill him because he would not bend the knee to the Roman rule? Was it <clears throat> the fracas at the temple with coin changers? Was he part of a plot to suspend 
Was he part of a plot or suspected of being part of a plot to defy the emperor? Was he just caught up in a raid of troublemakers from Galilee? I cannot tell you, but I assure you, if there is any truth in our Gospels, Jesus gave them plenty of reason to be put to death. But I prefer to believe that he was not an intentional martyr, but one who believed his own words, do not be afraid. He risked his life on behalf of others and lost his own life. He spoke truth and loved people he tried to save. We should all live that way. I hope this helps you understand better. If you would like more details, I would recommend, and then he goes on to recommend a list of books and resources that one can go and look at to further understand this idea. So understand what what this former pastor is saying in this article. He is saying that he doesn't know why Jesus died on the cross. And he is saying that most likely what happened is that Jesus, as he was entering into the city, gave the Roman officials reason to believe that he was some kind of insurrectionist, that he was some person who was uh, causing problems and, and threatening to overthrow Roman rule in the area. And so that for one of these many reasons, Jesus was nabbed up and, and crucified as a punishment but the author clearly believes that it wasn't for the forgiveness of sin. If you go back and look at this pastor's record and his history of preaching, he doesn't believe Jesus died to pay for the sins of the world. So that means the crucifixion of the Son of God is just kind of a happenstance thing and doesn't really have any spiritual ramification whatsoever. Now, this individual still claims to be a Christian, and yet they deny the major doctrine of salvation by grace, through faith, and the fact that Jesus paid for our sins. And of course, we understand from a basic reading of the Gospels that so many of the claims made in this article just are not true. You know, yes, there's a lot of historical accuracy in this article. Historical accuracies about crucifixion, about the swelling of the population in Jerusalem during the Passover, about how the Roman officials were told to kind of put down any insurrection that they saw. Absolutely. But the idea that Jesus was picked up at a random raid or was arrested because of his problems he created at the temple or for claiming he was king of the Jews by the Roman officials is just absurd. In fact, we know that going to the gospel account that Pontius Pilate wanted nothing to do with Jesus' crucifixion. He, he didn't want to crucify him and in fact, holding him before the people, he said, I find no fault in this man. So the idea that the Roman government crucified Jesus for breaking Roman law without any coaxing from the Jewish religious leaders, without any spiritual significance whatsoever, is absolutely absurd. It's ridiculous. And yet, here this pastor is writing this article saying, well, I don't really know why Jesus died on the cross. See, that's the kind of false teaching that we need to be wary of in our Christian churches. Because we know that Scripture clearly teaches us, as we saw in 1 Corinthians 15, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and He was buried, and He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. We know why Jesus died. The Gospel clearly tells us He died for the sins of the world. He died so that we could be in right standing with God. He died as the substitutionary atonement for our sins. And he did so willingly, under his own power, and under his own authority. And yet, what does this former pastor say? He says, I prefer to believe that Jesus was not a martyr, that he was arrested against his will and crucified against his will. It's absolutely absurd. And yet, how many people are led astray? How many people are led astray with doctrines teaching things like, well, they don't need to be reconciled to God because they were never separated in the first place? Or the fact that all people will be reconciled to God one day and that God forgives all people whether they believe in his son or not. See, these false teachers are dangerous. These false teachers are leading people away from the simple truth of the gospel. And that's what Paul was concerned with in his day. And that's what we need to be concerned with in our day as well. Now, Paul's worry and Paul's fear of these false teachers becomes evident as we look at the next two verses in this passage. Starting in verse 8, we see the text says, 
But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. Now this is strong language from Paul. This word accursed is the word anathema, and it means to be condemned. It means to be set apart for destruction. It's the idea of one being judged and condemned by God for eternity. And notice what Paul says, if anyone, if I, if one of my companions, if even an angel from heaven comes down and presents to you a gospel different than the one I preached, let him be accursed. I say again that if anyone comes forward preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. Let him be cut off. Let him be set aside for destruction. Let him be condemned for eternity. That's harsh words. And we are told that if anyone comes into the church preaching a different gospel, a different gospel that says anything other than Jesus Christ died for our sins and by placing our faith and trust in him, we can be redeemed, we can be justified, we can be placed right standing with God, we can be forgiven and therefore inherit eternal life. Anything different than that that false teacher is to be accursed. And there's an implication here that we are to treat them as accursed. And so that leads us to the question of, well, how do we treat someone as accursed? What's the way that we're supposed to deal with someone who the Bible calls accursed? So if someone comes into our church and they begin presenting a false do doctrine, not just a false doctrine, but specifically the doctrine of the gospel, if they begin to tell people that there's a different way to salvation other than through Jesus Christ, how is we of the church, how are we supposed to respond? How does one treat something that is accursed by God? Well, we have all kinds of examples of that as we go through the Old Testament. There are time and time again where God set things aside for destruction or set things aside to be cursed. And what such example that we have actually comes to us from Joshua chapter 6. Turn your Bibles with me to Joshua chapter 6. In this passage of Scripture, we see that Joshua has defeated Jericho. The walls have come tumbling down, and it's the first major victory that we see as, as Joshua is leading the Israelites through the Promised Land, cleansing it and reclaiming it or claiming it for the people of God. And so here we see that as the walls of Jericho come tumbling down, God gives them specific instructions with how they are to deal with all of the plunder of the city. Because during that day, if, if an army came through and they raised a city to the ground, well, they would get to go and plunder the goods. They would take slaves with them oftentimes. They would take all the fine things. They would take the food. They would take the animals in order to help them and sustain them in this land. But God had very different plans for his people because look what God tells them to do in chapter 6, verse 17. Here the text says, And the city and all that is within it shall be devoted to the Lord for destruction. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with in her house shall live, because she hid the messengers whom we sent. But you, keep yourselves from the things devoted to destruction, lest when you have devoted them, you take any of the devoted things and make the camp of Israel a thing for destruction and bring trouble upon it. And so this is what the people of Israel were commanded. They were told that, listen, as the city has been raised and you see all the things before you, all of it is to be set aside for destruction. And all these things set aside for destruction, you're not supposed to take. They were told to take some of the fine gold and some of the other precious things into the Lord's treasury. But the rest of it, no, don't touch it. It's devoted to destruction. It's something set apart from you, set away from you. And that's a similar idea of what Paul is talking about in Galatians. This idea of being set apart for destruction, to be condemned, to be destroyed. It's, it's the same language used at the final judgment. And so there's this idea that, listen, it's set apart and it's to be sent away. And yet what happens when that 
advice and that command isn't followed. Well, we see flipping over to chapter 7 and verse 1, well, that's exactly what happens. We look in the text here and it says, But the people of Israel broke faith in regard to the devoted things. For Achan, the son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of the devoted things, and the anger of the Lord burned against the people of Israel. And so God gave them clear instructions here. These things set apart, set aside for destruction, don't touch them. Don't bring them into your camp. Don't allow them into your life. You keep them away. And yet this man Achan, he took some of the precious things and he hid them for himself. He buried them under his tent. And what does the scripture say happened to him? The anger of the Lord burned against the people of Israel. And of course, we know what happened to Achan. Uh, eventually, the people of Israel, they go and, and they fight against the city of Ai, and they fail, and the Lord is not with them. And the Lord tells them that someone has taken the plunder when they weren't supposed to, and that's the reason they lost this battle. And then tribe by tribe, family by family, man by man, Achan is found out. Well, and the scripture says that he was stoned, and that his family was stoned, and all of his possessions were burned and destroyed as a result. And so, so what's the lesson that we have here from Joshua chapter 6 and Joshua chapter 7 that we can use to kind of enlighten us as we look at what this idea of being accursed is in the New Testament? Well, well simply this, <clears throat> what God has called accursed and what God has told you to set apart for destruction, you don't bring it into your home. You don't bring it into your church. You don't let it live and you don't let it take possession of, of the, the people in your congregations and the people in your families. You don't let them in. And now, that's a really harsh word and that's a really harsh teaching for especially churches living in 2020 because the culture in our country in 2020 is one of inclusion. Let anyone come, no matter what they believe or what they've done. Let anyone come in and take part in what we have going on here at our church. And yet, the scripture tells us is that if someone enters into our midst that is preaching a different gospel than that which Paul proclaimed in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that we are to treat them as accursed, which means we are supposed to send them away. We are supposed to see them as abhorrent, that we are supposed to see them as one set apart for destruction, and that we cannot let them come into our church. We can't let them reside with us. We can't let them be members because they preach a different gospel. Now, there is a temptation in many churches that if someone enters in and they do preach a different gospel, maybe that individual is a gifted teacher and they're very, very loved by the people in their classes. Maybe they are a skilled musician and they lead in worship. And there is a temptation to say, well, you know, this person is so loved and this person is so good. Yeah, they kind of have a different view of the gospel than we do, but maybe we can still let them serve and maybe we can still let them be, or maybe we can just still let them come to church. But the problem is, is that as people like that, with a different view of the gospel, enter into the church, well, they begin to talk. They begin to explain. They begin to teach. They begin to develop different groups and different followings within the church. And before you know it, you have a whole portion of your church that's being led astray away from the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, it's important for me to understand also and, and for us to realize that we're not talking about every single doctrine in the church here. And we're not talking about every position or every opinion about how church should be done. We as Christians can disagree about all kinds of different things when it comes to Scripture and when it comes to the Bible, and yet still worship right alongside one another. That's where Paul actually writes in the Scripture saying, well, some of you are convinced that you should worship on the sixth day, and some of you should, are convinced that you should worship on the seventh day. Well, let each of you be fully convinced in your own minds and go off and serve and honor the Lord. See, there are places where we can disagree. Paul also writes about this when he writes about the idea of Christians disagreeing about what kind of food they should eat. Where there are some uh, of, of Jewish heritage who have a real big problem with eating meat that's been offered to idols. And there are others in the Gentile faith who don't have any problem eating meat offered to idols since those idols aren't even real anyways, but it's still good meat. And what does Paul say? 
If you have a problem eating the meat, don't eat it, but don't hold that restriction over your brothers. And if you don't have a problem eating the meat, that's fine, but don't gloat in your freedom over your other brothers who, who have a problem with it. So he says, listen, go and do what you're going to do, and you can still worship together, and that's fine. And all those secondary issues, things like, well, what kind of song should we sing in church? What should the order of our service be? How exactly should we administer different uh, ordinances of the church? And what's the process and the procedure that should take place? We don't have to agree 100% on those things. Those are secondary doctrines. But the gospel is at the core and heart of everything that we do. And we need to guard it. We need to guard it preciously as we teach, as we proclaim, as we bring people into membership. And, and you know what? We're going to be just really blunt about it as we lead the people of our church. If you come into church and you say, well, yeah, um, I understand who Jesus was in the Bible, and I understand that, that he was a great teacher and he was a great prophet, but you know, I really believe that God is just going to save everyone, and therefore we don't really need the sacrifice of Christ. And in fact, Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, it wasn't even really a payment for sin. He was really just kind of a, a moral guide showing us what real love looked like. Well, you're not going to be allowed to be a member of our church. You're not going to be allowed to teach. You're not going to be allowed to influence people in that way because that is a false gospel. And it, we're not going to tolerate it as we come together. And that's not a popular view in 2020. It's not a popular thing to look at someone and say, you can't be here. But that's exactly what Paul says to do. And we always do so with the hope that as being expelled from our congregation, that those people would come to the truth of the gospel. They would realize the error of their ways, and then they could come back and be welcomed into the fold. But the bottom line is, is that if anyone preaches a different gospel than the simple truth that Jesus Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, was buried and raised from the dead, according to the scriptures, if anyone teaches a different gospel than that, well, let them be accursed. Let them be set aside for destruction. Let them be separated from our local body of believers. And that's not a popular opinion, but guess what? We're not called to be popular. We are called to serve God, as Paul writes in the next verses. In verse 10, he says, For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. And that's the question you have to ask yourself, especially as you're dealing with how we in the church interact with those in the world. We have to ask ourselves the question, who am I trying to please and who am I trying to serve? Am I trying to please God or am I trying to please man? Because if we're just trying to please man, then we are no longer servants of Christ. And you know what? Sometimes it's tempting just to please man, especially with the doctrines that we teach and, the, and the, the truths that we hold in our church. You know, a lot of them are very unpopular in the world around us. You know, we believe that marriage is between one man and one woman for life. And in our country, in the day and age we live in, that's not a popular opinion. We believe that God created each individual man and woman, and that there is no in-between, that there is no spectrum of gender, and that your actual gender is always linked with your biological sex. And guess what? That's not a popular opinion in 2020. And yet we hold them to be true. We believe that God created the universe by the sheer power of His will, that He expects us to live in a certain way, and that all of us have sinned and therefore are guilty before Him. And you know what? Telling someone that they're guilty isn't a popular opinion in 2020. We also believe that the only way to be forgiven, that the only way to be made right with God is to place your faith in Jesus Christ, to accept the sacrifice that he has made as a payment for our sin, and in doing so, to receive his righteousness, his holiness, and his spirit.
And that's the only way you can come to God. And you know what? Telling someone that there's only one way to be forgiven and only one way to come to God, it's not a popular opinion in 2020. But guess what? We're not here to win a popularity contest. We're here to speak the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And why is that all so important? Why is that important for us to know and understand and be bold in our witnessing and be bold in our preaching, to stand firm on the foundation set before us in Scripture? Well, it's important because there is only one spring of life. You can't be forgiven and you can't reach that life eternal in any other way except through Jesus Christ. He is exclusive in that regard. And so if we were to just open up you know, the floodgate of ideas and we were to say, hey, it doesn't matter what you believe. Hey, it doesn't matter who you follow. It doesn't matter what kind of bent that you have. Believe whatever you want. Everything's great. Everything's fine and everything's good. Well, we would be leading people away from the only hope they have in this world. We would be leading people away from forgiveness. We would be leading people away from life eternal. And we will be leading them straight into the pit of hell. And we need to be guarding against that, which is why Paul is so adamant that we protect the gospel. And so in your life, as you are watching here now, do you believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ? Do you understand what the gospel is all about, that Jesus Christ died for your sins? And when you're pressed, are you able to defend it? And are you able to explain it to those who so strongly disagree with our position? That's what Paul calls us to do. We are to guard the gospel. We are to protect the gospel. And it may not make us popular, but it is the only way we truly can serve our Heavenly Father. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for today. We thank you for the joy that we have in serving you, and we thank you for the love that we find in your Son, Jesus. I ask you today, Lord, that you would help us to protect our church against false teaching and false doctrine. I pray, Lord, that we would understand that that our belief and our faith system is not progressive and it is not evolving, but, Lord, you have given us the complete revelation of your Scripture. And that, Lord, we just need to stand firm on the foundation that you have given us. And that, Lord, we look forward to your return. We thank you, Lord, for the wonderful blessings you have given us in your word, in your son, and in your spirit. And, Lord, it's in the perfect name of your son, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us here this morning. I hope you have a wonderful day, and God bless.